there is much confusion today, much talk about it. Everybody wants to kind of argue and wonder about what is salvation and what is discipleship. Um, what does it look like? Some people are using words like easy believism. People just easily accept Christ, and surely it's got to be more than that. Some uh, people just ask, you know, what does it truly mean to have a life with Christ, to be redeemed, to be saved? All those words that are Christian words that uh, we, I call them church words. You say saved to somebody outside who's never been to church, and that, they think you got pulled up out of a, uh, a lake when you were about to drown or somebody gave you CPR. God did that for us. God pulled us up out of a, a sinking sand, the old song says, and gives us new life. He gives us breath, new breath, new life, new choice. And I'm grateful for it. I, I want to talk a little bit about salvation real quick before we talk about discipleship. What does it mean to be saved? Well, some get saved and just immediately become a disciple of Jesus Christ and they're on a new path and bam, they're off and going. I like to see those every now and again. Matter of fact, it encourages my soul when I see those people. They just go from here to here, praise God. New flesh, uh, old flesh is gone, new life begins. Some get truly saved, but in their life, there's really no discipleship that follows. And because of that, some of those idols remain in their life. And they continue to live what you and I could call a blended obedience. Some parts of their life they give to God, some parts they don't. Now, you may say, well, preacher, that's just not right. But it's true. A lot of people that get saved get saved when they're young. Most of the people get saved before they're 18 when they make that decision. And yet, we don't always give the greatest amount of true discipleship. And if you get saved, truly saved, but you don't fall into a pattern of being discipled, you're going to go through hardships because that's life. You're going to go through uh, some difficult times, and if there's someone there to not help you sort those things out, then the old ways will just be there, and you'll be living with those old idols. An idol is anything that you think more of, trust in more of, or desire more than God. And that creates a blended obedience, sometimes obeying, sometimes not. Sometimes one is serious about salvation, yet there's no repentance in their life. That Holy Spirit conviction will be there, yet there's no commitment. And I wonder sometimes. They wonder sometimes. Salvation is in the hands of the Lord. He knows when someone is serious but sometimes people are just saying, well, I don't know. I, I kind of believe. I kind of want. I definitely feel conviction, but they don't really give their heart and life to Christ. They don't commit their life to Him. They go on to live their life their way. And there are many people like that. And I'm afraid that's a very sad way to go through life. Some... They just go through the motions. They watch others. They just do A, B, C. They just go through the motions. It's very easy. Decisions are made with the brain, but they're never made with their heart. You ask somebody if they believe in God, sure. Do you believe in Jesus? Sure. I've heard it my whole life. Do you believe Jesus came and Yes, I, I do. I, you believe he died on the cross and he rose again? Yes. But there's no life change. There's no conversion. These are things that 
make me wonder. I think we need to know about our salvation. I think we need to be sure about it. Very quickly, I will tell you that one of the very true signs of salvation is God's love in you. Scripture says you, they, will know you, they will know you are my disciples by how you love one another. When you accept Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit in your life, and that is everything of, of the nature of God that's coming to live within you. So God is love, amen? And as you seek Him, as you seek to follow Him, as you are, see people the way he's, He sees them, as you, you will begin to love people, you will be able to forgive people. You will be patient with people. You will be kind with people. Without you even knowing it, the gifts of the Holy Spirit will be produced in your life. The very nature of God. That's one of the evidences that you know of your salvation is that you'll have a true desire for the things of God, a hunger for the things of God. Now, I do understand that there is this thing called common grace. When you're born into this world, there are certain graces from God that will be for everyone in the world. He gives us life. He gives us the enjoyment of food. There's a certain amount of, we get a breath. Amen, that's the grace of God. We get the energy to go and work. And, and we live our life under our desires and, 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 and our thoughts. And, and, and we'll say this is, this is the grace that God's given us, but he gives that to everyone. But God gives a different grace to those that are his. You're now a child of God, and you seek to follow God. Now listen, as you seek to follow, as you desire, as you hunger, as you obey, and as you open up, you will find that God wants to bless you a thousand times, whatever number you want to put out there, a thousand times more than you even understand. He wants to give you his very best. That's his desire. He loves you with an everlasting love. He wants to do for you in such an amazing way. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. God pouring out his rich blessings. By the way, it might all, not always seem like he's pouring out blessings, but he is. I cannot tell you how many times I've looked back on my life and I thought God had let me down. He didn't let me down. He gave me what was best. Sometimes we're spoiled and we just want things the way we want things. I'm grateful that his wisdom that is complete knows how to give us what we really need. He doesn't always give me my wants, but he always, always gives me my needs. I'm not going to ask you to stand in honor of reading God's Word like I normally do because we're going to look at quite a few verses of Scripture. But let me pray real quick, and we're going to jump into this because there was a person here that we're going to find today who had a longing and a desire in his life for God, and it came up short. So let's pray. Father God, we do love you. I'm grateful that you made yourself known to me. I'm grateful that you came expressing your purity and your holiness because I had sinned that showed me in my life that I, I didn't have that. I longed for that purity and holiness and love, but I didn't have it. But you extended it to me. And I'm grateful that you did and you made a way. And I met you there. My life has been different. I chose you that day because you chose me first. And you desired for me and today you desire for me. And Father, I pray for everyone that hears your word today, that they will know that your eye is upon them, your heart of love is there for them, your desires of goodness and blessing are there. 
Father, help us to go from where we are to where we need to be by your grace and by your goodness. The plans that you have for us, they are mighty good. Lord, let your perfection be seen as something that can be grasped and not lost. Received, oh, praise God, received and not just missed. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. In Mark chapter 10, we hear the story of one that I, I, I've always heard this term, this person called here. He was a very rich man. He was a young man. He was a person who, who had positions of leadership uh, in the church and in, in the community. He dressed the part. He looked the part. He, he was a religious person, well off, respected. But in verse 17, it says, Now as Jesus, or as he was going out on the road, one came, what's the word? Running. There was something inside this man that says, I need to get to Jesus. A desire, an obsession. This is not casual. This is something that is the impulse of his heart. And he finds himself getting there as quickly as he, as he can. And when he gets there, he falls before him. He knelt before him. That shows me that, that he came in humility. He came in respect. This is a man that others look to him with respect. But when he came to Jesus, he was freely willing to give this man great respect. Hear his words. Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? He understood inheritance because most likely everything he had was because of the grace of birth. He was born into something. He was born into the right family. He was born into a rich family. He was born into a religious family. I thank God that God allowed me to be born when I was to the parents that I have. I, I, I thank God that my, my dad got his life right with God after World War II. I, I thank God that, that my dad was met with a man by the name of Gail Smith who was knocking on doors. And Gail Smith, who, who would, who would uh, park his car and, and because he couldn't afford the gas. And he would walk down one side of the street and back upside of the other side of the street and, and met my dad and began to disciple my dad, a man who was already a Christian. But he began to love on my dad and show him the ways of God. And, and my dad got in church. I praise God for that. And, and my dad began to serve God and he became a deacon in the church. I praise God for that. All this was before I was ever born. He accepted the call to preach. The only man that I knew as my father was a preacher. He lived the most consistent life that I've ever seen in any person. He was the same on Sunday morning, same person on Monday night. He was always the same. I'm grateful that I had the grace of God to have parents who took me to church, who loved on me, who provided for me, who blessed me. And when I was 10 years old, on a Sunday night, when the Holy Spirit met me and called me, I went running and I fell on my knees before God, and I wanted to get saved. If you've ever had that impulse, that's a grace gift of God, to be convicted of your sins and feel the drawing, the love that God matters to you. Really, it's like this. There may be 8 billion people in the world. He knows the hair on every head, but at that point in time, his total attention is on you. He desires to give you everything. All the things that we know of God that are in the very presence of who Jesus is. Jesus came to empty himself so that he could fill you up with all of those. The blessings of God. How much do you think the Father loves Jesus the Son? That's how much he wants for you. That's how much he desires to give to you. He says, what do I need to do that I may inherit eternal life? Jesus knew exactly what he meant. Today we would say, what do I need to do to be saved? What do I need to do to give my heart and life to, to, to Christ? Well, Jesus goes right to him. Verse 18 says, why do you call me good? Number one, there is none good but one, and that is God. Really, he's trying to... to, to to, to ask out, do you think that I'm from God? Do you think that I 
What, what do you think of God? What do you think of me? Am I the one that's coming? Could I be the one? So he gives him the answer. By the way, this answer is correct. He said, uh, you know the commandments. Y'all know the big 10. Y'all know the top 10. I mean, there's all kinds of things we ought to do. Can we start there? Wouldn't that be great? Hold on, let me just say this. We're forgetting these. Some of us grew up and, 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 and our parents and our schools and all those showed us these. And they were respected and we had the Ten Commandments everywhere, right? We go into a courthouse or something like that or the town square, or all those things. Those things were everywhere. They were highlighted. They're not highlighted so much anymore, are they? Take note of that. The world doesn't want you to look at these. The world doesn't want you to see these. Jesus knew them. He knew that this man knew them. He says, you know what the commandments are. You don't commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. This is not all of them, but hey, that'd be a great place to start, wouldn't it? Listen to this young man's reply. He answered and said to him, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. That didn't mean that he was perfect. But he was saying, I knew those things. I tried. But it doesn't really matter how much you try to be good. You're not good enough. How many of y'all been in here failed? One, two, three, four, five. Oh, more? Some of you just failed the test right there. God in heaven's looking down and said, I'm not, not, mm -mm. You messed up a whole lot more than you want to admit. How many of you failed? I'll raise both hands. Praise God. So we're 100%. We failed. How many of you wanted to do good? So sometimes we do good, sometimes we don't. But listen, if you compare yourself with yourself, you might think you're doing a pretty good job. Some days you'll think you do better than others. But you want to do right. That's not going to get you to heaven. How many sins does it take to become a failure? How many sins does it take to separate you from a holy God? Hold on. How many sins will separate you from God in a place that's called hell forever? But we just said that all of us have failed. He's saying, I, I, I've tried, I've, I've I followed these things. I, I knew that these were the truths. I knew these were the right things to do. But Jesus is going to tell him that's, that's not enough. Look what it says, verse 21. I love this. It says, and Jesus, look at this now, when he was looking at him, I think he was looking in his eye. I think he's seeing his heart. And when he sees this person, I love this, it says that he loved him. Today, understand this and know, when God is looking at you today, He is looking at you through the eyes of love. He loves you. For God so the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever should not perish but have. Are y'all good with that? He looks at you through love. He desires you to have heaven. He wants you to know joy unspeakable and full of glory. He wants you to know the peace that is beyond all understanding. He wants you to feel the freedom where the Spirit of the Lord is. There is liberty. There is freedom. He wants you to know kindness. He wants you to know everlasting life. He looked at him. Oh, when he saw him through those eyes of compassion, he looked at him and he said to him, one thing you lack. Wouldn't it be great if there's only one place that you messed up? Jose, wouldn't that be great? Just to know that there's one area. You mean there's only one thing I got to do? That'd almost be exciting, wouldn't it? 
Well, he says, all right, just do this. Go your way. As you go, sell whatever you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Hold on. And come. Take up the cross. In, in your Bible, it may be written in red. It is in mine. Take up the cross. Give all this stuff that you have. Sell it. Get rid of it. Give it to somebody who needs it more than you. Take up the cross. Take up the cross. That's what Jesus was going to do. He was headed to Jerusalem to take up the cross for me and you. The servant is not greater than the master. If he came to take up the cross, Jesus' words here, Jesus' wisdom here, Jesus' desires here, no longer live for yourself. Take up your death penalty. Come on. We need to get to the place where you find the end of yourself because when you find the end of yourself, you'll find the beginning of God. One of the greatest words I ever heard, uh, I, I was talking to an addict one day, and, and he said, uh, I didn't know rock bottom. That's the bottom of us. He said, rock bottom's got a basement. When you think you've hit rock bottom, you're going to go lower. But I'm here to tell you, when you get as low as you can and you're looking up, there's a God who is there. He says, follow me. Take up your cross. Take up the end of yourself and you'll find the beginning of eternal life. Follow me. You see, this argument that goes on about salvation has to do with, do people really get saved? And the, the whole reason that they're saying there is this easy believism is this. Oh, I come to church. Yes, I don't want to go to hell. If I have to repeat after you, I'll repeat after you. You want me to get back? I'll get baptized. Yeah, right. And then I'll go off and live my life any way that I want to because now I've got Jesus and, and I'm good. But hold on, you, you never did find the end of yourself and you haven't followed him. You followed him under your rules, but you haven't yielded it all to him who created the rules. You want to do things your way rather than God's way. You're comfortable with your way, but he wants to give you the best. Well, this young ruler knew exactly what Jesus meant. So it says in verse 22, he was sad at this word. The word means he was absolutely downcast. He was probably running to Jesus. He had maybe had a tear in his eye, but there was a longing. Come on now. There was hope. There was a desire for eternal life, but it's not the way that he thought it would be. Oh, I can't do that. You want me to do what? You want me to give up my life? Evidently, riches meant a lot to this person, and that's why Jesus pointed that out. You see, he knows the idol in your heart. And whatever that idol is, an idol is anything that you love more, desire more, and follow more than him. Whatever this that idol is, it could be anything. He says, that's got to go. For this person, it was all that went with the prestige of his life. It was the money. It was the, the clothes. It was the being known. It was all of that. He just thought, I can keep all of this all my life and have Jesus as, or eternal life as the cherry on top. But the only way that you find all of that is to lose everything. But he always gives back more. Verse 23. Well, hold on. 
I, I, I forgot one half of a sentence in verse 22. He was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So he came with hope, but he left empty. Can you just see him walking home? Uh, uh, uh. Verse 23, Jesus looked around and said to the disciples, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of heaven. How hard it is for those, for people who have certain things to give them up. They, they want those things. They're not willing to turn loose of. His disciples were astonished at his words. Astonished. Jesus answered and said to them, Children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches. This is their source of happiness. This is their source of completeness in this world. This is where they're getting their, their, their identity, their significance. How hard it is for those who have, who are trusting in what they have, to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. I've heard scholars, I've read about, about these people who said, well, the, the, the eye of the needle is this little entrance into the temple and, and they could get a camel through, but it took a lot of pushing and pulling to get them through. This same word is used in other places where it actually means like a sewing needle. And y'all know the part of the sewing needle where you put the thread in it. He's speaking of an impossibility. So I don't really think he's talking about that gate that goes into the temple. I think he's talking about that needle like you use for sewing. Think about this. How in the world are you going to get a camel through that? It's impossible. Can we just say that? But he gives this great illustration. Now it's in our head and we can't miss it. It's not just hard to do. It's impossible to do. Now it says in, in verse 26, and in verse 24, it said they were astonished. In verse 26, they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, well, who then can be saved? Man, this is impossible. Jesus looked at them and said, with men, it is impossible. Did y'all hear that? You can't be good enough to get saved. You can't be good enough on your own. I think I'm a pretty good person. Treat my wife well, don't kick my dog, pay my bills on time. I look around, I see a whole lot of people worse off than me. I, I, I think I'm all right. I'm not perfect, but I'm okay. Bless your heart. <laughs> with this, with men, this is impossible, not, not with God. For with God, I love this, all things are possible. Say it with me, church. All things are possible. You did good. Let's hear it one more time. Good and loud so that your, your confession of faith can be heard in heaven. All things are possible. I don't care what you're going through. God plus you is a majority. It doesn't matter how big, it doesn't matter how deep the hole is. It doesn't matter how strong the poison is. It doesn't matter how far the roots go down. With God, you can have new life. Well, Peter began to say to him, see, we've left all and followed you. Let me just ask you, with your heart, have you left all? Everything else fades away. Just give me Jesus. Just give me Jesus. Not Jesus plus anything. Just Jesus. You see, we think we've got to have hold of some security. Some happiness. I, I read something and it stuck. And I believe it's true. People really aren't afraid of change. 
What they're afraid of is loss. The rich young ruler would have changed if Jesus told him to do 10 more things. But what he couldn't do was give up loss in his life. But when Jesus was trying to get this across to this man, he said, take up your cross and follow me. You lose all so that you can gain everything. You give up all and follow me and I'll direct you on the path of life forevermore. Sounds to me like a pretty good deal. But many don't do it because they're willing to give what they're willing to give, but no more. Now, hold on. Let's talk about this follow me. Peter said, I've given up everything and I'm following you. Maybe you say, I'll give up this and I'll give up this and I'll give up this. But are you willing to follow him wherever he leads? We make you lie in church all the time. Mark will sing this song at the end of the service. And we're all singing this together. Wherever he leads, I'll go. When we mean most of the places he leads, I'll go. Whatever he asks, I'll do. Really? Wherever he sins. Wherever he takes me, I'll follow. That's that blended obedience. I'm willing to give this. Are you willing to give that? Well, listen to Jesus' reply, verse 29. Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, truly, truly, verily, verily, I'm telling you the truth here. I'm telling you, I say to you, there is no one who has left houses, brothers, sisters, fathers, mothers, wife, children, lands, for my sake, for Jesus, and the Gospels, I believe that is evangelism and discipleship. For my sake, Jesus' sake, to receive Christ, evangelism, receiving Christ, and for the Gospels. Are you willing to receive but not willing to go? Do you want to have the grace of God but not live in the grace of God? Are you wanna, do you want to... Be obedient enough to get saved, but not obedient enough to do anything with it? Hold on. If you're willing to leave houses, brothers, sisters, fathers, mothers, wife, children, lands, for my sake in the Gospels, he says, I tell you, who shall not... At the beginning of verse 29, he says, I say to you, there is no one who has left who shall not receive, verse 30, a hundredfold. And you can put any number there you want, thousandfold, a millionfold. Houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and lands. With persecution. And in the age to come, eternal life. You're going to give up a lot. You're going to get more. Hundred times more. You think that you've got to hold on to this to keep your happiness. You can't lose that. But what he's literally saying is, I will bless you. You, you think you're losing things? No, no, no. I'm going to add to. But he's honest enough to say, it's not going to be easy. The servant is not greater than the master. If they did those things to Jesus, they're going to do them to you. If you're willing to say, Lord, I'll accept you, and you better give me wisdom, you better give me health, you better give me vacations, you better give me enjoyment, you better give me all the things. And Lord, if, if, if my TV goes out right in the middle of the Super Bowl, I'm going to be angry at you. Lord, I tithe, but I can't afford that new iPhone. So I won't tithe. 
Let me just tell you, tithing is a blessing. I get to tithe, not I have to tithe. I want to love my God. I want to let him know money doesn't have me. I give him the first fruits of everything. My time, my time in the word of God, my prayers. And when eternity begins, you'll be just beginning what life is. Then he says something that really is tough on people. Many who are first will be last and the last first. I want to read it to you out of the New Living Translation. But many who are the greatest now will be least important then. And those who seem least important now will be the greatest then. The one thing I like about how the New Living Translation says that, for many who are the greatest now will be least important then. But those who seem least important now will be the greatest then. We have been told, just get saved, and that's all you got to do. And I said this last week, salvation, baptism, that's not the finish line. That's the starting line. But if you truly get saved, there's going to be a passion and a hunger and a desire within you just to want more. A hunger and a passion for more. More love. More serving. More kindness to others. Not just being forgiven, you've been forgiven, but more forgiving of others. More love on others. More patience with others. More salvations for others. There's a growing fire that is within you. My life verse, Philippians 3.10, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable even unto death. I know that I got saved when I hit rock bottom, but I find the blessings when I stay there. Because when Brian gets big, Christ kind of goes to the wayside. But when I decrease and he increases, man, does a joy flow. I'm up here today by the grace of God. It's not because I'm good. It's not because I'm smart. It's not because of any of those things. I was just, for some reason, chosen by God to be the one here who could just share the good news of Christ. The greatest thing that ever happens in my life, the greatest thing is when I see the growth of others through the Word of God. I just get so fired up when people hear it and they, the light comes on. Y'all hear me? And they begin to catch it. And they begin to desire it. There's so many people that are so casual with it. But I love it how people just love Jesus. Are you willing to be saved? Are you willing to be a disciple? Are you willing to follow him wherever he leads? Do what he does, say what he says, love by how he loves? You want to go do it your way? Or are you willing to do the drastic, take up your cross and follow me way? God is in heaven is hoping that you'll say, I'll leave it all behind. Because you know what he's going to do? The Lord's going to get excited. There's somebody that's loving me. There's somebody that's trusting me. There's somebody that I can pour out my riches on. Woo, let's open up the floodgate. Let's let the Spirit flow. Let's let the joy of the Lord come. And as long as we are wise enough to let God be God, oh, what He can do.